Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. I want to welcome everyone that's here. And um, I, I want to thank uh, everyone that prayed for the meetings in Lethbridge. They went really well. On, um, on Wednesday night, Pastor Pat preached from Lacombe. The church there in Lethbridge uh, has a deaf ministry. Uh, many of you will remember when Bud and Jenna Ring came through and uh, he presented his work and, and um, he tries to get deaf ministry started in churches. And so uh, in Lethbridge, uh, they were able to get um, actually quite a, quite a thing going down there. And that's been going now for a couple years. And uh, so there is this, um, you know, I guess on any given service, they'll have seven or eight or 10 deaf folks up on the front row off to the, the right hand side. And um, there is an older couple that they have come very faithfully ever since they started the deaf ministry. And they're a sweet couple, very friendly. Um, uh, you know, Brother Bishop will be talking, you know, say something funny. And, you know, the interpreter's interpreting. And there's always about a five second delay before they get it. And then all of a sudden, this guy will just bust out laughing. And then everybody else laughs, you know, because he just got it. And um, so, you know, they're, uh, they, they look like they were in their late 60s. And they've been praying for him for quite a while. And the situation was this. They would talk to them about the Lord and about their need of salvation. And um, they would agree, um, but they, you know, they always had some reason, some question, some excuse. And usually when they talked to them, both the husband and the wife were there together. And so if something got addressed to the wife, he would answer it, you know, and so he was always sort of running interference. Well, that night at the end of the service, um, the guy sought somebody, sought one of the deaf interpreters out and he said, you know, I, I need to be saved. Well, unknown to him, at that same moment, his wife was going to one of the other interpreters and saying, I need to be saved. And so they both got saved at the same time without each other's knowledge. And um, the church had been praying for them for quite a while. And so, um, uh, you know, they got saved and then it erupted. I mean, the service had already been dismissed. But then get saved and all, and everybody's lingering, you know, just like we do here. Everybody's lingering, and then all of a sudden, uh, they announced it, and and the deaf guy, the deaf guy and his wife, I, I think the way they say praise the Lord is they do this, and all of a sudden he's holding his hands up and he's doing this, you know, and everybody's doing that, and uh, and you know he's he's not saved two minutes, <laughs> and he gets in somebody's face and he says, "You need to be saved." <laughs> just get right after it, and so. So praise the Lord. It was it was really a blessing to watch. It was good good services. Thank you so much for praying. The Lord really blessed. I have a card from um, uh, Brother uh, Brandon Lake and his wife from when they were here. And it's just a little short note. It says, uh, Pastor Newman in Capital City Baptist Church, thank you. What a blessed time. Thank you for all the hospitality and kindness. God bless you all. And so, uh, Lord willing, I'll have that off to the side. And I mentioned a couple weeks ago, that somebody had left a ring at um, Brother Lichty's house the day of the Thanksgiving get together. So if you are missing a ring, please come and see me and describe it. And uh, I have it in my pocket. So, uh, so guys, if I get attacked, help me. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so, you know, if you're, if you're missing a ring, uh, we've got it. Also, I just want to throw this out there. I got I got a call last week, and um, somebody has a relative that had to have emergency surgery in the Royal Alec Hospital, and it's some sort of back surgery. And um, uh, it's um, I think it's a, it's a lost relative, and um, and they live. The person that called me lives uh, a fair distance from here. And they said, um, would it be possible for any of you folks here at Capital City to deliver food once a day to the Royal Alec Hospital? And I said, well, you know, we'll see. So, um, you know, I'm assuming, you know, we we would work it around your schedule, whatever, whatever works. Um, if anybody is interested in doing that, if you would see me after the service, 
it, I think that would really be a blessing. If we can get several folks involved, you know, it'll lighten the load. Just one person do it one day, one person do it another day. And, um, and I think we would only need to do it. I'm, I'm sort of assuming for three or four days, I, I would find out more details, but if you're interested in doing that, please see me after the service. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke this morning, Luke chapter nine, Luke chapter nine, and let's begin at verse 51. I am just, it, it never ceases to amaze me how the Bible is, is God's book for all time. Like it's just as relevant today as it was when it was written. Sometimes it seems even more so. Luke 9, verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now this is speaking of the Lord Jesus. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Now you got to remember who the Samaritans were. They were a half-breed group. Uh, they were a group that, um, you know, that in this time period, the, the Jews would really have prided themselves on having a very pure bloodline. And um, but the Samaritans, uh, during some of the captivity, the the Jews had intermarried with some of the people of the land. And so you had a group of people, and they were called the Samaritans. They lived in Samaria. And Samaria had been long since conquered by Babylon. And so there had been much intermarriage with the people of the land, which you have to remember was actually not lawful for the Jews to do. And so they had intermarried. And so what had happened was you had this half-breed group, and um, uh, they, they sort of decided to come up with their own system of religion, they sort of developed their own culture, independent of the Jews. And the Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and the Samaritans didn't like the Jews. Verse 52. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they, that's the Samaritans, did not receive him, because his face, our Lord's face, was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for just the wonderful privilege to be here this morning. God, we thank you, Lord, for the songs we've sung. And now, Lord, as we look at your book, we pray that you would communicate, Lord, to us. And, um, Lord, that we would all walk away, Lord, having felt and experienced and understood what you want us to. And, Lord, more than that, that, Lord, we, we wouldn't just... Think about it, but Lord, we would actually do something, something that would please thee. Lord, that a decision would be made. Something would be done, Lord, and it would be eternal. And God, and you would be pleased. Lord, we pray you'd rebuke every distraction. And Lord, all the work of the evil spirits and Lord, even the our own minds, Lord, that perhaps will bring up something, Lord, some pressing business or something from last week or something this morning. Lord, in Jesus' name, help us to forget all that. And Lord, in Jesus' name, we pray that you would help us all to have open hearts, truly open hearts to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 51. It says, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. You know, the reason his face was set towards Jerusalem, because he is approaching Calvary at this point. You know, Jesus Christ came and, and he lived 30 years. And, and for 30 years, he was uh, uh, virtually unknown except in Nazareth. And he was 
known as the son of the carpenter, and that was his trade. He was a carpenter under his father. But at 30 years old, he was baptized by John in the River Jordan, and he stepped into the public arena. And, and really, that's most of what we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is those three and a half years. And we only read actually just a very tiny fraction of what he did, but that's what those books are filled with. His whole goal was to go to Calvary and pay the sin debt of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The only way that could happen would be on the cross. And he repeatedly told his disciples, he said, guys, he said, uh, you know, you've been with me and, and you've done my bidding, but the day is coming when I'm going to die and I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and I will die and rise again three days later. And that was always a, a puzzle to his disciples. They didn't understand that. They thought that he was going to set up his kingdom because there were verses in the prophets that talked about that. But, you know, they had the, they had the time frame confused. You know, they didn't understand that his, his coming kingdom would not happen until much, much later. But here, the scripture uses a phrase. It says he set his face toward Jerusalem. In Isaiah 50, and you don't need to turn there, but it says, the Lord God hath opened mine ear. This is a prophetic passage it's as though the Lord Jesus is speaking. He said, the Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. You know, the Lord reaches that place with the three and a half years uh, of his public ministry were filled with a lot of glory. And of course, there was always that element there in the background, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they were always plotting against him. But you know that really the three and a half years of our Lord's miracles were great days. But suddenly he reaches a point where he knows it's time. And man, he looks towards that cross. You know what he said in John 12? Jesus said, now is my soul troubled? And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus saying that? It's not that he was unwilling because he says later on, he says, Father, not my will, but thine be done. But he looks at the agony that's in front of him. In Luke 22, he's in the garden. <clears throat> and it says, in being in an agony, Man, is the sin of the world, your sin and mine, as that burden begins to fall on him. He says, Father, save me from this hour. And then he says, but for this cause came I unto this hour. He became sin for us who knew no sin. You know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says that Jesus and Moses and Elijah were talking and Peter is listening to the conversation and it says they spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Jesus said in Luke 12, that I have a baptism to be baptized with. And, and he wasn't talking about water there. He said, and how I am straightened until it be accomplished. Straight means distressed or pressed. He said, I have a baptism. It was a baptism of suffering. The, the thought of baptism is always being immersed. And he said, uh, he said, wow. He said, I am about to be plunged into the suffering of my life. You know, Satan hates the gospel. He hates it. He hates the simple, correct gospel. The word gospel really gets thrown around. But, but the word gospel, by, by Bible definition, 1 Corinthians 15, it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the news of all time. It is the message for the world. 
Paul said in Romans 1, that message is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. You know, in some religions, um, you know, the various religions, Satan attacks certain things. In some religions, he attacks the life of Christ. You know, there's some groups out there. There's some ministers out there. They, uh, they don't believe that Jesus Christ was truly born of a virgin. They don't believe that his miracles were really miracles. They have just this rational explanation for all that. In some religions, Satan attacks the deity of Jesus Christ. They say he wasn't God. And there's a bunch of them that say that. They say he really wasn't God in the flesh. And some religions attack his sinlessness. The religion of Hollywood is like that. Anytime Hollywood comes out with a story about Jesus, you know, they've always got, you know, a Mary Magdalene in there who's making advances and, and there's always this, this implied overtone of immorality about Jesus Christ. But the Bible says he was without sin. He was without sin. In some religions, Satan attacks the resurrection. They, uh, they believe he died, but they don't really believe that he bodily actually got up from the dead three days later. And in some religions, they attack the blood of Jesus Christ. There was a famous Bible teacher of many years gone by, and he's still alive and still still got quite a following. And I remember being in my early 20s, and uh, he was one of those guys, evangelical, okay? That means supposed to be Bible-believing. And, um, and there was a lot of these guys back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. They had uh, radio broadcasts and this guy was one of the big names during that time period. And he came out with this teaching that Jesus Christ could have been strangled or drowned and still have been the Savior. And that is false. Because without the shedding of blood is no remission. By his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, you didn't, you didn't buy your way in heaven, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us. It, it is, we are saved by his blood. You know, uh, that was the problem with Cain, was Cain tried to get into uh, the presence of God by a bloodless offering. You know, Abel offered a lamb, and Cain offered the fruit of the ground. They both knew that they were to offer a blood sacrifice. We know that from Hebrews 11. They both knew that. But Cain tried to come without the blood, and he was rejected. Satan hates the gospel. In some religions, the death of Jesus Christ is attacked. And they say he didn't really die. They say at the last minute, somebody else was slipped in his place. Or they say Jesus actually swooned, but he didn't really die. But again, in Luke chapter 9 on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah speak with the glorified Christ and they spake of his decease, which he should accomplish. In 1 Corinthians 11, you know, we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and it says, "Ye do show the Lord's death till he come. In John 12, Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This spake he, signifying by what death he should die. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I am he that liveth and was dead and am alive forevermore. You know, if you stick to what the Bible says, there's just some conclusions that you can't get around. In our text, it says he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. There was no turning back. In Hebrews 2, it says he was going to taste death for every man, for every man. 
Look at verse 52 of Luke 9. You might want to stick a bookmark there, a piece of paper, where we might look at a few verses in a moment. But in verse 52, Luke 9, verse 52. It says that the Lord Jesus sent messengers before his face. You know, he was going to arrive there in chapter 10, verse 1. It says the Lord sent 70 also, two and two, before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. You know, the Lord, it's interesting, the wording of verse 52. The Lord sent messengers before his face. The Lord sent messengers before his arrival. And you know, the Lord's still doing that. You know, the Lord is, he is, he is going to arrive here before too awful long. He's going to arrive. He is coming. Amen. And you know what we are? We're the messengers that are spreading his message before he arrives. Look at verse 52. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. This was going to be an opportunity to the Samaritans. In John 4, the woman of Samaria, you know, Jesus meets her at the well. And she said, you know, she said, uh, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You know, the Samaritans, they were considered another race. They were considered another ethnic group. But Jesus sent word of his coming to them. Jesus Christ is for all men everywhere. He's for every race, every nation. Go ye, Jesus said, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus sends messengers to the Samaritans. He is coming. He's going he's to pass by their village. He's going to walk through there. Would they receive him? Would they welcome him? And the Lord Jesus is always the issue. He, he is always the issue. He is the issue. You know, it's not about a system. You know, it's, it's, it's not about a chance to connect with a bunch of nice people. It's, it's not about a way to somehow feel better our, about ourselves. I, that's not what any of this is about. Ultimately, this is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 53, it says, and they did not receive him. They did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. They did not receive him. You know, uh, it's like Jesus got there or got nearby and, and they, uh, they just sent out word, you know, you're, you're not welcome here. And why was that? Because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. You know, Jesus loved Jerusalem and his people. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. He loved his people. And he loved Jerusalem. But the Samaritans hated the Jews. And by hating the Jews, they rejected the Son of God. The greatest opportunity of their lifetime, the greatest blessing that would ever come their way, they forfeited, they threw it away. Because of their hatred for the Jews. Hello. There's a lot more to this than you realize. Keep your place there and look at Ezekiel 25. Ezekiel 25. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 25. You know why they rejected Jesus? Because they saw that he was looking towards 
Jerusalem. And they couldn't stand Jerusalem. And they couldn't stand the Jews. So they told the Son of God goodbye. <laughs> Ezekiel 25. Ezekiel 25. Verse 12. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah. You know, there was Jacob and Esau, okay? And, and, and the line of Israel came from Jacob. Esau is Edom, okay? And Edom became another, another people group, another race altogether, okay? Look at it, verse 12. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance. And hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it. And I will make it desolate from Teman. And they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. Therefore, verse 15, thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it. Now watch the wording. This is incredible for the old hatred. Have you ever looked up the word Palestinian? You ever looked it up? I encourage you to look it up. Look it up anywhere. Look it up on Google. And of course, Google is always trying to control the flow of information. Google is, you know, you got to be careful. They're not, they're, they're going to restrict you from certain access. Uh, but look it up on, look up the word Philistine. Look up the word Palestine. Palestine comes from the word Philistine. You know how the Lord talks about, he says, he says, there's been an old hatred. It goes way back. Look at verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch up mine hand upon the Philistines, and I will cut off the Carathims and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. And I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. You know, um, there, there is a real spirit uh, that, that hates Israel. And, uh, you know, that's nothing new. If you've read your Bible, that's just nothing new. Um, and... Um, Look at Jeremiah 31, Isaiah, Jeremiah. If you go back to your left, you're in, you're in Ezekiel. Go back to your left. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31. You know, you can talk to some people about this, and we've, we've talked about this quite a bit because in the last, you know, long before the most recent developments in the Middle East, there's been several discussions here uh, in our church because we, we had a few people that um, came in our midst that were very anti-Israel and very vocal about it. And, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to disagree. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I really don't, um, I don't see some people believe in what's called replacement theology. They believe that the church replaced Israel and God will never, never use Israel again. And, you know, we, we don't believe that here. But you know what? We have people in our midst once in a while that come in, and they hold various doctrines. And and uh, you know, uh, you can you can disagree sweetly. You you can disagree, and you know, somebody can say, "Well, you know, I I'm really not sure that I agree with you on that." But they're still smiling. They still love you. They still love the Lord. You know, they're and and but there's another side to this 
And we watched this on several occasions in the last five years where we've had people come into our midst. And man, if they detect that you believe that God yet has a place for Israel in the plan of God, um, it's not just, oh, you know, I, I don't really agree with that. But, you know, hey, man, whatever you guys. It's not like that. It's all of a sudden their countenance falls and their face gets dark. And there is an anger that rises up within them. And man, you have struck a nerve. I asked a Lebanese friend of mine who's a believer. And he, he, he understands that God still has a place for the Jews and, and very much so. And we were discussing this, this thing of, of, of how people get so believers. I, I understand lost people, they feed on the media. And when you feed on the media, you're just going to be messed up. And that's just the way it is. You know, you're, you're going to get your head all twisted. That's just the way it is. But when you feed on the Word of God, boy, there's, it's, it's just hard to come up with some of these conclusions that people come up with if you read it for yourself. Now, if you're following somebody online, I mean, hey, I understand. You can, again, just get your head all twisted up. But if you read the Bible for yourself and you just read it and let it say what it says and you just keep reading and you compare Scripture with Scripture, boy, it's just really hard to come up with some of these Positions that people come up with, but all, be all that be all that as it may. I said to my friend, "Why is it that when this subject comes up, some people literally a darkness and a rage comes up in their face?" And he looked at me and said, "And he's from Lebanon. He grew up in the Lebanese Civil War." He said, "Man, he said, you know, you watch those video clips of what's going on over there, and you hear the machine gun fire and the bombs." He said, "I," he said, "that was an everyday sound where I grew up." You are blessed here. You are blessed. But he said, he said, brother Joe, he said, actually, I was just going to ask you the same thing. And then I got hold of the book and I was reading it, and the guy said this. He said, "You know why people? You know why that hatred comes up in their face?" He said, it's because they're like their father. The devil hates Israel. Verse 53 of, of Luke 9. Oh, you know what? Yeah, we'll just skip that verse. I'll give you the verse. If you were going to read it, you can read it on your own time. I was going to have you look at um, Jeremiah 31.20. If you're writing verses down, Jeremiah 31.20. But we're, we'll, we'll just pass that for now. We'll go to back to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 53. It says, And they did not receive him. They would not welcome the... The creator of the universe. They would not welcome him. Because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. His face. You know what that's saying? It's saying uh, it was written. We, we have an expression. We say, you know, oh, so and so, you know, it was written all over their face. Or, uh, or we say he's easy to read. You know what they looked? And they could tell Jesus was passing through. And uh, they didn't know, but Jesus was going to preach to them. He was going to offer salvation to them. And there were some of the cities of the Samaritans that did get on board and did believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You find that out from John 4. And actually that movement began to spread. And you see it again in Acts chapter 8. But this particular village said, no, we don't want to. They said, it looks like you're distracted. It looks like you're headed towards Jerusalem. It's written all over your face. They weren't going to receive the Lord Jesus. Now you listen to me. Because he wasn't on their side. He wasn't on their side racially or culturally or historically. You say historically? Yeah. You know, remember the woman at the well? She looked at Jesus and she said, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that Jerusalem is the place to worship. Jesus wasn't on their side. Jesus loved them. He was about to die for them. But they said, oh, he's not on our side. 
you know, there is a cancer that has crept into our, our ranks. And that is, uh, you know, you, you start feeling somebody out and you start listening to them and you try to figure out they're on your side. You know, the Internet has been a blessing in many ways, but in many ways, there's been a whole pile of collateral damage. And the Internet has brought us untold division. I mean, this latest outbreak in the Middle East, uh, it, you know, there again, you know, it, I was thinking about this as a kid. I, I remember, I remember years ago, I remember the conflicts in the Middle East when I was a little kid, you know, and, but you know, we were little kids. Uh, it, it wasn't a big deal. I don't remember any of the adults, you know, any of the adults, you know, and the neighbors fighting or squabbling over any of this stuff. It just, you know, you know how we live? We live like, oh, that's over in that part of the world. You know, it, it doesn't have anything to do with us. But you know, we live in a day when everybody minds everybody else's business. And that's, you know, part of the, part of the joy of Facebook is, is you can spread your business all over the world. And you can just wait for them to like it. And if they don't like them, you, you cancel them. You talk about the height of childishness. And there's some other choice words and I'm biting my tongue. God said there is six things. God said, Proverbs 6. God said, there are six things I hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto me. And he starts listing the things he hates. And the last one on the list is he that soweth discord among the brethren. You know, there are some of these internet guys. I'm telling you what, God is absolutely hot against them. You say, well, they, they preach the Bible. Yeah, but you know what they're doing? They're wreaking havoc in churches. And God says, God, God's not a little perturbed. He said, I hate this. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The Lord said that. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, he says, you guys in Corinth, he says, no, I'm, I'm ad living. You have to go to the Greek for this version. He says, you guys, what is wrong with you? He says, he says, some of you say I'm a Paul. Some of you say I'm a Cephas and, and you know, and, and I'm of this one and I'm of that one. And God says, you're carnal. God says, you're, you're not close to me. You, you are far from me. You're taking sides. I thought this was about the Lord Jesus. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said in Ephesians 6, grace be with all them which love our Lord Jesus in sincerity. He says, you know, we may not dot our I's and cross our T's all the same, but if they love the Lord Jesus as he truly is, he says, he says, grace be with them. Even if they're not, on my side. Paul said, Paul's sitting in prison. And he says, some preach Christ of contention, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. He said, there's guys out there preaching. And he said, they're trying to make me look stupid. And they're trying to get under my skin. And he says, but, but you, know, you know what Paul's reaction was? Paul's reaction was, let's have a prayer meeting and scorch them. <laughs> That's not what he said. He said, you know what? He said, they're preaching Christ. And he said, so I rejoice. Even if they're not on my side. It's a cancer in our ranks. It costs the Samaritans in this village their eternal soul. Because Jesus was not on. Hey, I'm telling you. Jesus may not be on your side this morning. You see, he wants you to be on his side. They would pass Jesus by. Do you know why? Because their heels were dug in and their pride ran deep. They didn't like where Jesus was going. You know, that's, 
Jesus was going God's way. He, he isn't going your way. Or he's not going my way. He's going his way. And he's not looking to join your side. But he is giving you an opportunity for you to join his side. And Jesus Christ was going to pay their way, the Samaritans. He was going to pay. He knew. He knew how they felt about him. He knew how they felt about Jerusalem. And you know what? He was, he was, still, going to, he was still going to pay their way to heaven. But they said, oh, no. You listen to me. They said, oh, no. If we have to change what we've always believed, no, we don't want him. Oh, no, if we have to associate with this, these people over here, no, we don't want him. If you're going to ignore our cause and our version of history, no, we don't want you. If Jesus, if you're going that direction, you can keep on walking. You know what Jesus did? He said, okay, I'll keep on walking. How foolish, how stubborn, how damning. In verse 54, the scene changes. Luke 9, verse 54. I love this. James and John. Some of us can identify with Peter. Some of us can identify with James and John. James and John, their original, uh, their original nickname was the Sons of Thunder. And you know God did a great work in their life. A great work. Because later on, John is known as the apostle that Jesus loved. And John becomes the, the, the disciple of love. And he writes 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And man, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John are full of love from every angle. You know, God really did work. You know what that does? That gives hope for all of us. You know, all of us, we, you know, we've got our kinks and we've got our rough spots. But, but man, the Lord did work in these guys. But at this point, they're, they're all zeal. And they're, they're fiery. Verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord... Wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? They said, Lord, you know what they saw? They saw, you know, to their credit, to their credit, they saw the foolishness. They saw the wrong. They saw the attitude of the Samaritans. And they said, Lord, you don't need this, and we don't need this. How about we just burn them off the map? You know, it is possible for Christians to really have totally wrong perspective. <laughs> How about we just cook them? <laughs> but you got to remember this about the Samaritans. They were lost. They were Christ rejecting. Now you listen. They were racist. Well, that's nothing new. They were racist. And they didn't like Jesus. You know what James and John didn't understand? James and John didn't understand what Isaiah had written hundreds of years before. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows. And acquaint Jesus understood, you know, rejection. Well, it's a big thing in our society in the psychological realm, you know. And, you know, Jesus knew all about rejection. This did not surprise him. They said, Lord, should we, should we, should we nuke him? Look at verse 55. But he turned and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit you're of. He said, man, guys, he said, your, your spirit is all wrong in this thing. Verse 56. For the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. A man of long ago said these words. He said, it is possible. It is possible to have much zeal for Christ and yet to exhibit it in a most unholy and unchristian way. It is possible to imagine that we have the scripture on our side and to support our behavior by scriptural quotations and yet to commit serious errors. It is as clear as daylight from this and other cases in the Bible, that it is not enough to be zealous and well-meaning. Very serious faults are frequently committed with good intentions. 
let us notice what a solemn rebuke our Lord gives to persecution carried on in the name of religion. Well, an awful lot goes on in the name of religion. I mean, in our ranks. Boy, there's intimidation and there's threats and there's blackballing and there's anonymous phone calls and there's financial threats and there's legal threats. And, and you got to remember who was always threatening our Lord. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was his enemies. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not. But mighty through God. Jesus looks at Pilate in those, in those final hours before he's crucified. And he says, Jesus says to Pilate, if my kingdom were of this world, he said, then would my servants fight. But my kingdom is not from hence. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. You know, there's just these wonderful people all around the world. And, um, and we've got lots of them here in Edmonton. And, um, um, you know, they fly that flag with the moon. You know which group I'm talking about. And, um, and they, they hate Christians. And, and um, there was one of them that was talking about in one of these places where they kill Christians. And, uh, and this is what he said. It is hard to kill real Christians because they are so nice. I'm thinking, I don't think he's met some of the ones I've met. <laughs> it is hard to kill real Christians because they know their kingdom is not from this world. Boy, the first wave of real persecution, the first wave of the real stuff is going to clear our ranks of all those hateful, defiant ones. And probably for a few minutes we'll go. Whew. I had a friend of mine, he was talking about, uh, he was an evangelist and he was talking about, uh, he was at this preacher's house. And these preachers were talking and they were sort of really talking you know pretty hateful about this other church this other pastor that they didn't like and uh and and you know he was silent and so they kept waiting for him to jump in the conversation and and you know and and pat them on the back and agree and he just sat there quietly and finally one of them says so uh what do you think and he said there is one accuser of the brethren and i am not he Verse 56, look at it again. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. He is, he still is the Savior. He is not the destroyer. He is not the hater. He is not the vigilante. He is not the screaming, shaking his fist one. He's not the spewer or the curser. He is the Savior. Look at 1 Peter 2, and we're about done. 1 Peter 2, go to the end of the New Testament there, and you'll see, you know, Timothy and, and Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, and then you'll see 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter 2. He is the Savior. He is the Savior. Man, he's trying to save people. And he still is. Aren't you glad he saved you? Look at 1 Peter 2. Now look at verse 21 first. 1 Peter 2 verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Okay, so he said Christ is our example. Look at verse 17. Look what he, look what he says there. Lord, shall we nuke him? Verse 20, verse 17. Honor 
all men. That means treat them with kindness and respect. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood as long as they agree with you. No, it says, is it? Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly. Jesus said, I am kind to the unthankful and the evil. Now listen, judgment and fire will come. It is coming. It is coming, but not now. Not yet. It's coming. It's coming, but not now. And it says, he rebukes James and John. And it says, and they went to another village. You know, those Samaritans, they passed Jesus by. So you know what the Lord does? He says, well, he says, maybe somebody else will, will listen to me. You know, Jesus, you know, he didn't get his feelings hurt and he, he didn't have to take a day off and, you know, he didn't have to recover. You know, he is despised and rejected of men. He, he knew it would be that way. He knew that some of the Samaritans would receive him. He knew some would not. You know what happened when he knocked on that door? And they said, no, we're not interested. He said, he, you know, he didn't cuss at him. You know, he did. He looked at the disciples and said, well, boys, there's another village just over the hillside. We got a message. These guys don't want it, but, but maybe the next place will. And James and John, you know what they were? They were rebuked and corrected. They were rebuked and corrected. You know what they didn't do? They didn't go, well, fully. That's as far as I'm going with Jesus. He embarrassed me publicly. He probably, he probably jerked their chain right in front of all the other disciples. You know what they did? They were probably embarrassed because they're made of the same stuff as you and me. And they probably thought, well, <laughs> we were wrong again. And they loved Jesus. And Jesus wasn't done with them. Jesus rebuked them. They took the correction and they kept moving. You know why some Christians stop moving? Because God corrects them, but they don't take the correction. And man, they just get stopped dead right there for God knows how long until they get over it, if they ever do. But there's a key to keeping moving with the Lord. And there's a key to walking with the Lord. And it's like, when he corrects you, and he will, and it'll happen lots. When he corrects you, you just bow your head and say, Lord, I was pretty stupid, wasn't I? <laughs> Lord, I'm sorry. And you know what he'll tell you? He'll say, that's okay. Lesson learned. Got another village. Got another village. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, help us now. Lord, help us to see clearly. Lord, help us to understand the things that are truly important. Lord, help us to be willing to drop our pride. Lord, maybe we just need to get alone with you and just talk about some things, Lord, that we don't understand. Maybe we just need to, Lord, mellow out our approach just a little bit. Maybe we just need to realize, Lord, this really is still all about you. Lord, it's not about us. It's not about people being on our side. Lord, we know that you want to walk with us, Lord. We know that you do. You want us to go forward. Lord, maybe somebody this morning, Lord, they just, maybe they just need to talk to you about something, Lord. Just get something cleared up. 
and reach out, Lord, you're, and you'll take their hand again and they'll go forward. Lord, help us this morning, whatever the need may be. Lord, there might be someone here who doesn't know you, Lord, and they have, um, they have not received you. They've not welcomed you, Lord. God, it's a wonderful thing that you keep knocking at their door. Lord, the day may come when you pass them by. God, would you help them? Lord, they just realized, Lord, that all you want to do is save them. Lord, that's all you want to do. Lord, you have no ill intent on their life whatsoever. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as God has spoken to you this morning, why don't you talk to him this morning? Man, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. It wasn't long before he was going to die. You know who he died for? You and me. What a thing he would die for you and me. He sure didn't get much of a good bargain when he got us. But he did it because he loved us. He loves you this morning. Christian, could you, could, you, could you get back on his side this morning? Could you quit insisting that everybody be on your side? Aren't you glad he didn't burn you off the map? You know what he kept doing? He kept hanging on. You know why? He's hoping you'd say yes to him. Well, I'm sure glad I said yes to him. A savior Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Thank you that you're the Savior. And God, those that are saved this morning, we can say, thank you, Lord, that you saved us and you washed us from our sins in your own blood. God, thank you, Lord. Bless and let your word go home, Lord, with your people, Lord, in their thoughts and in their minds, in everyone that's here this day. And God, may they say yes to you about whatever it was that you spoke to them about, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.